And so our next speaker is uh, John Schiller uh, from the National Institutes of Health, National Ca Cancer Institute. Uh, John uh, is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, a PhD uh, from the uh, University of Washington in Seattle, uh, and is now chief of the laboratory um, of cellular oncology at N NIH. And of course, as we know, he has, uh, he and Doug Lowy have been responsible for uh, the probably the most underused vaccine uh, in, in the world, um, uh, unfortunately, for reasons which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, but he is uh, the recipient of uh, the Sabin Gold Medal, the Lasker Award, uh, and he's uh, still working on um, second generation HPVs. So, John. Let's see, where's the clicker here? Okay, well, I'd like to start out by actually saying that I think with the HPV vaccine, we've actually stumbled on a vaccine that has met the goals of the Human Vaccine Project. Basically, a vaccine that subunit <clears throat> that can work by a single dose and induce lifelong immunity. So the real challenges for this vaccine is one, to convince regulators that that's true. Okay. Second is to figure out why this vaccine has those characteristics as opposed to other subunit vaccines. And third, to translate what we have learned to develop other vaccines that have the same characteristics. And so it'll be going through is first of all, giving you an update on the performance of a single dose of the HPV vaccine, tell you about some new clinical trials that hopefully will convince regulators that we can move to a single HPV vaccine, single dose HPV vaccine, and then tell you about what I think are some of the interesting questions, especially immunological, that have come out of the analysis that we have done of these vaccines, and then in a little bit about how maybe we can translate what we've learned into developing other vaccines, which is the goal of this consortium. So as I think um, Natalie just sort of mentioned, just remind you that, that HPV vaccines are subunit vaccines. They're, they're composed of a single protein, the matricapsid protein L1, and there's multiple types in the vaccine, 2, 4, or in the case of Gardasil 9, 9 HPV types. And again, as Natalie mentioned, the biggest difference between the vaccines is that the, the GSK vaccine contains ASO4, which has a TLR4 agonist, whereas the Merck vaccines just have aluminum salt. And these vaccines are remarkably effective at doing what they're supposed to do, which is to prevent cancer. So if you look at here, both vaccines, this is after a four-year clinical trial with the most cancer proximal endpoint cervical ep epithelial neoplasia grade three. You can see in women who were naive for, the, for those particular types, they didn't get any SIN3 by the types in the vaccine. And it's not too bad against genital warts either. So what we did is in, in most of the trials, there was the, the, the only individuals that were analyzed were those that got three doses. But in the, the, the Costa Rican trial, which was sponsored by the, by the NCI, we began to look at what was happening with women who got a single dose or two doses. And we have quite a bit of data on this. This is just one example which shows the cumulative incidence over a seven-year period of shown here, HPV-16, the types targeted by, by the vaccine, the types in which we see some levels of cross-reactivity, and the types in which there is no activity. And what you can see is after seven years, there's no significant difference between the attack rates for the vaccine types, um, either targeted or partially protected. But importantly, there's also no differences in the types that there is no protection, which suggests that, that the exposure of genital HPVs is not differential by vaccine dose. Now, it's important to point out that the women were not randomized to get a single dose in this trial. They just happened to get a single dose for other reasons. And it's also important to point out that the number of one dose or two dose recipients is rather low. Now, since we published that data, they've, some of the other companies have started to look at the one dose um, analyses. And in a four year post hoc analysis of the GSK sponsored trial, they also found that there was similar efficacy by one, two, and three doses. And more recently, in a, in a trial of Gardasil, which is a cluster randomized trial in India, 
that was interrupted for political reasons. They also found similar protection, now up to seven years, in women receiving one, two, or three doses. So one of the questions is, is it time now that we should now start to advocate that countries, especially low-income countries, move to a single-dose vaccination? And we believe that these post hoc findings, all of the, the findings I've, I've just quoted, came from post hoc analysis and trials where they weren't randomized to get a single dose. That, that because of that, it provides insufficient evidence to generally promote implementation of single dose HPV vaccination programs. But I think there's a little bit of window here for early adoption in low resource settings with the contingency plan that if the trials that I'm going to be talking about in a minute don't work out, you could then reboost. Uh, at a later date and provide most of the protection, albeit it's going to be harder to, to, to re-enroll the, the young ladies later on than it would be to, to vaccinate them two or three times now. And so the NCI, with help of the Gates Foundation, has just recently undertaken uh, a formalized randomized trial where we're going to compare one dose versus two doses of Cervarex versus one doses and two doses of Gardasil 9. And the reason why we're using two doses is that fairly recently, based upon immunological equivalence, non-inferiority, it's been shown that two doses in 9 to 14-year-olds is immunologically equivalent to three doses of either vaccine in older cohorts, 16 to 25, in which uh, efficacy has been demonstrated. And so these will be relatively large uh, trials, 5,000 women, 12 to 16-year-olds, and the primary endpoint is going to be persistent infection. So it's now generally accepted that we don't need to have um, a disease endpoint for licensure. And we're going to do a survey of HPV prevalence. We can't do a placebo controlled trial with a vaccine that's already been licensure, uh, licensed in these countries. Uh, and so we're going to do a, a, a survey of HPV prevalence in age matched girls in the re region and then immediately vaccinate them. It's going to be four years and then a long term follow up. So he'll, based upon this study, we'll provide definitive evidence one way or another that one, vac one dose of vaccine can induce long-term protection. So now getting in, uh, into the, the, the heart of what I want to talk about is, is why do these vaccines work so well? Why do they give us such long-term protection um, even after a single dose? And really, like most things in biology, it's multifactorial. But the three main regions are, first of all, the vaccines are exceptionally good at inducing neutralizing antibodies. I'm going to spend some time discussing why we think that is um, and giving you some evidence for that. The other thing that we think is, is actually very important is that the infection mechanisms that HPV use make them exceptionally susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. And unfortunately, in 20 minutes, I can't get into this at all, but it really has to do with the fact that, that they're exposed to, to neutralizing antibodies for a much longer period of time um, than, than most types of viruses. And lastly, it's just the obvious thing that these are DNA viruses, so unlike HIV, where there are RNA viruses, they're not a moving target. They don't, they don't replicate in the swarm. And so we really believe that, like most antiviral vaccines, antibodies are likely mediators of protection. And very quickly, the main reasons is that we see that cross-protection in the clinical trials largely mirrors the cross-neutralization we see in antibody-mediated assays in vitro. And importantly, we can passively transfer protection against experimental challenge, inter intravaginal challenge in animal models with serum from vaccinated animals. And lastly, this pro target protein, L1, the major capsid protein, isn't expressed in the basal epithelium of the ep basal layer of the epithelium where the virus infection is being maintained. So we, th we think it's unlikely that CMI mechanisms are going to play a major role as effectors in clearing the virus infection. As a matter of fact, these, virus, these vaccines do absolutely nothing if you already have an infection. They're not, they, there is no evidence that they act therapeutically. So in terms of antibody response, the first amazing thing about this vaccine is the consistency of the antibody response. Basically, it's 100 percent to a rounding error. This is just one example of Gardasil, the, the less um, immunogenic vaccine because it doesn't have a TLR agonist. And the second amazing thing is that the antibody titers, unlike most subunit vaccines like tetanus or, or, or diphtheria or tetanus toxoid, doesn't continue to drop. It stabilizes. So this is data out to 10 years by age. What you can see is after the first few years, 
basically there's no substantial drop in antibody titers, indicating that we're generating long-lived plasma cells with this subunit vaccine. But the really amazing thing is that if you give a single dose, you get the exact same thing. You get long-term stabilization of antibody res responses. And in this case, after seven years, 100% of the women who only got one dose were still seropositive in either an ELISA or an in vitro neutralization assay. In the levels of antibody, you really don't get that much bang for your buck if you're looking at plateau titers between three doses and one dose. The difference is fourfold. And it's still tenfold higher than what we see after natural infection, which is kind of a straw man because natural infection doesn't induce very good antibody responses because the virus is shed into, into the mucus in this never of viremia. But suffice it to say, if you look early on, the difference in titers are maybe a thousandfold because the boost generate these short-lived plasma blasts that we don't think contribute long-term to the long-lived plasma, plasma cells that are generating the long-term antibody response. Now, one of the questions that comes up when you say, well, everybody's still seropositive, it could be that half the women are dropping off the table and the other half of the women are getting, having environmental exposure to the virus and are getting natural boosts. But we don't think that's the case because this is the data for the individual women getting one, two, or three doses. And what you can see, it's, it's a beautiful curve at around 10% drop over these three or four years. And you can see there's a couple outliers out here. We think that these are actual ex examples where they're getting a natural boost from an infected partner, but that's not what's maintaining the titers, the GMTs long term. It's that everybody is dropping just a little bit or not at all. So let me just give you a little bit of a, a, a brief update on data that isn't quite ready for prime time yet. We're still really looking at the data, but we now have the data out to 11 years for single-dose recipients. And what I can tell you is that after 11 years, um, there still is, after a single dose of Cervarex, there's 100% and 99.5% of the women remained seropositive in an in vitro neutralizing assay to 16 and 18, respectively. And we don't see any drop that we can detect in titers between year 9 and 11. So this is a really an example where we're generating long-lived plasma cells that if they haven't gone down in 11 years, I think it's unlikely they're going to fall off the table. Um, and we don't see any difference out to 11 years, again, uh, in the prevalence of HPV 16 and 18, the targeted types are, are 31, 35, and 45, where we see partial cross-protection. Now, one of the interesting questions is, is what, does, what role does the adjuvant in Cervarex play in this ability to generate long-lived, durable antibody responses even after a single dose. And so we're very interested to see this, this emerging data from Gardasil, which contain, contains just a simple um, alum adjuvant. And apologies to, <laughs> it, it looks like in terms of generating long-lived plasma cells, the adjuvant isn't the critical feature. There's no doubt that Cervarex generates a higher response, more antibodies, at peak and also plateau, but it's not needed to generate long-lived plasma cells. There's something else in the vaccine that, that's responsible for that. And it's, it's, it's actually interesting that the difference between one and three doses for this vaccine is also fourfold, okay? So that, that it's not, a, the, the dose thing is, is, is not dependent upon adjuvant. So one of the things based upon this this difference in the response to Cervarex and Gardasil, we've actually proposed and we're about ready to start a trial in which we hope to be able to get the EMA, um, the European Medicines Association to or agency, to license a single dose of Cervarex based upon immunological equivalence to three doses of Gardasil. And so this will be an immunogenicity um, trial, which interestingly enough, we think we've convinced them to use plateau titers, not peak titers, as the, the measure of immunoequivalence, because we know it's going to be inferior to three doses in terms of peak titers. But again, that's not important when you're talking about vaccinating a 9 to 11 year old and protecting her when she becomes sexually active, when she becomes a woman. Plateau titers are all that matters. And so 
the idea that we can get amino equivalents is based upon some data from the liter literature where basically if you look at one versus three doses in women, at most it's sixfold lower, okay, depending upon the age in, in the, the vaccine, in the uh, HPV type. We know that Cervarex versus Gardasil in head-to-head -head comparison is about sixfold higher, and we know that the younger individuals have about a two-fold higher response than 18 to 25-year-olds where we know the vaccine works. And so if you do the simple math and do the multiplication, we actually predict that one dose of Cervarex will give us higher plateau titers than three doses of Gardasil. But it's easy to do the math, but we really don't know whether the immune system really acts multiplicative <laughs> in this case, or whether it'll be additive or subtractive or whatever. So I think it's a really good experiment to do, but also could lead to early licensure of one of the vaccines for a single dose, which would really be important from a public health point of view. So the reason we think one dose works so well is that if you look at the quality of the antibody responses from one versus three doses, we really can't detect much difference. And one example is, is if you look at the relationship between neutralizing titers, the good antibodies, and the binding antibodies, all antibodies, in an ELISA, you can see there's a, a linear relationship and they're about one to one. The correlations are almost the same. So it doesn't look like the quality of our antibody responses is increasing with boosting. Also, I think extremely interesting is that we see affinity maturation. Um, this is just in a, in a chaotropic um, ELISA. Um, over the first four years, but again, at the end of four years, the affinity is about the same for one dose versus, versus three doses. And after that, then we get a plateau and we don't see any increase in affinity. And so as the first question, what really is the, the mechanism for this affinity maturation that we see that continues not for months, but for years? And it does this despite the fact that the antibody levels are actually stabilizing during this period. This occurs even without boosting. And it seems like there's, there's two possibilities. One is that the VLPs, because they're very sticky, are retained on follicular dendritic cells, and they have to be in a confirmationally correct, um, well, they have to be confirmationally correct because denatured antigen doesn't work. So to generate neutralizing antibodies, so either they remain there for four years, or what I actually like the idea is that what we're seeing here in this affinity maturation is preferential survival of long-lived la long plasma cells that got the strongest signal initially and have the highest avidity for, for their antigen. And the, it's very hard to interrogate long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow, but one of the predictions of this is, is if it's due to continued germinal center reactions, we would predict that there'd be an increase in antibody diversity or at least a change over time. If it's due to, to preferential survival of a subset of the plasma cells, then we would predict a decrease in antibody diversity. And we should be able to, using proteomics, to add the antibodies that bind the VLPs, we should be able to distinguish between those two possibilities. So question number two, are the long-lived plasma cells induced by boosting derived from naive B cells, memory cells, or both? And you know, as Bill talked about, that answering this question, I think, really has important implications for the types of vaccine strategies he discussed involving different prime and boost antigens to guide um, immunoglobulin maturation along specific pathways. And so now from, from the HPV VLP vaccine, we know that if you, in, in black, if you antigen prime, you can go down the pathway through germinal centers and generate long-lived plasma cells. There's no doubt about that. But what's happening in the boost is, is that next group of plasma cells, or the next group of, of long-lived plasma cells coming from the same pathway where you're activating naive B cells, or is it coming from the, the, the memory B cells? We know that they can generate plasma cells because if you wait even eight years and VLP vaccinate, you get this burst of short-lived antibody responses. But I don't think we really know whether memory B cells can generate long-lived plasma cells. And the reason I think that it may be recapitulating the same thing as what's happening in the prime is that this boosting after vaccination is approximately additive for generating long-lived plasma cells 
we see a minimal increase in avidity. And so therefore, maybe the memory B cells aren't really involved. We're just doing the same thing over and over again. And I think we really don't know. And so what we're, we're, we're just started this experiment is to take advantage of, of a system that Mark Slifka developed when he was in Rafi Ahmed's lab, where there's, in black six mice, there's allelic variants of IgG heavy chain. They're called A and B. And, there's, and he developed monoclonal antibodies that, that can distinguish between these two classes of antibodies. Uh, or from, from these two strains. And so it's a very simple experiment where you VLP vaccinate, for instance, A, and then specifically transfer the memory B cells and then vaccinate um, the recipients, which have the, the other allelic variant, and then look over the course of the year which ones end up being around long term. And if the H, you know, immunoglobulin A VLP stabilize over time, then we know that long lived plasma cells can be derived from memory B cells. And if we only see long-term stabilization of IgGb, then the type of, of you know, vaccinations procedures that are being touted by Bill and other people, which I think are very interesting, then I think we have to sort of second guess that. So I think it's important to look at this question. Now, in terms of why there are such good immunogens, you know, we really think, and there's some evidence, although it's not completely strong, that this idea of cross-linking the B cell receptors is really the key, where you're getting strong survival, activation signals, and key signals that are maybe more important for generating long-lived plasma cells than they are for short-lived short -lived, um, plasma blasts and memory B cells. And we think that this spacing of 50 to 100 angstroms is, is going to be an important feature, um, as first proposed by Bachman and Zinkernagel about the same time, incidentally, that we started to make the VLPs. But there are other good things that VLPs do. They have the right particle size for efficient trafficking to lymph nodes. They're readily phagocytized and so induce strong T helper responses. And interestingly, um, this is something that Martin Bachman has, has, has found, is that this, the polyvalency leads to stable binding of natural low avidity IgM and complement, which can promote their acquisition by follicular dendritic cells. So they become very, very efficient at binding the, just the antigen presenting cells that you want. Another thing that they do is that they're really efficient at breaking peripheral B cell tolerance. And we've also shown in, in a transgenic mouse model, the Goodno model, that virus-like display of a neo-self antigen can effectively reverse B cell antigen. And so why is this might be important for our vaccine? Well, I think it might help explain why everybody seems to respond well to it. So if you, it turns out that most mature B cells are actually self-reactive. And so if you take monomeric antigen, there's relatively few developmental pathways they can go through, especially when you consider that during hy uh, somatic hypermutation, you may generate some more self-reactivity. But if you can activate energic B cells or not undergo deletion of self-reactive of, of B cells during the germinal reaction, then neutralizing antibodies can arise by many developmental pathways, even those involved in uh, energic pre precursors or self-reactive intermediates. And this may help explain why we get such good, strong, consistent responses in all of our vaccinees. So question three, so this is, gets to the heart of, of looking to the future. What structural features make the polyvalent antigen um, virus-like in the interaction to B cells? So it may be more than, we're starting to think, more, it's more than just closely spaced epitopes on a particle. And we're more and more really realizing that HPV VLPs are kind of special and that they have really locked down neutralizing epitopes. It's really hard to protease, to, to disrupt them by protease treatment. They're really, we think, locked down. And with the, the platform itself is rigid. And so one of the questions is how much flexibility in the platform or in the target antigen can be tolerated to have this really strong response by the B cells and make them, quote, virus-like. And it's clear that the HPV vaccine does not have these characteristics. Um, after one dose, it induces a poor serum antibody responses. Three doses wane over time but it does induce a good memory response. And this could be for multiple reasons that are not mutually exclusive. Could have too few repeats. It's floating around in an antigen, in a lipid bilayer. It could be too small. And it could be that, that not all the antigen is displayed in the same conformation because there's eight cysteines that form the antigenic determinant. And when you make it in yeast, it's not at all clear that they're always formed in the same way. I'm just about out of time. 
And it's also true, you may not know much about this vaccine, but the, the hepatitis E vaccine, which is also a virus-like to particle, about 20 um, nanometers, and it clearly is not like the HPV vaccine because even after three doses, it continues to wane over five years. And in green, after a single dose, only 25% of the people are still seropositive. So it's not acting like the HPV vaccine. And finally, the last question is, do memory B cells or long-term plasma cells um, mediate protection? I think this is really important to decide when you're developing a vaccine. Because for the HPV vaccine, we, we really think you need our onboard antibodies because once you have an infected infection, the antibodies do nothing, and the natural infection does, of the vaginal tract doesn't do much to induce antibody responses. And we really think virus-like display is the best way to, to generate long-lived plasma cells. But there's a whole other class of vaccines, like the hepatitis B vaccines, where it may be sufficient to have memory B cell responses because you can get an anamnestic response, though you might not pre prevent initial infection, you present, prevent disease. And I still think it's an open question whether virus-like display is really superior for generating memory B cell responses as opposed to long-lived plasma cells. So if you're developing a vaccine, decide what's gonna be the major effector because it can decide whether you wanna go through the problem of making a virus-like particle vaccine or not. And I'm not going to talk about this, but I think IgD cross-linking is the key to it being virus-like. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, and, and thank my collaborators, especially Doug Lowe. He's been my partner in crime for the last 35 years and all this. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, you could convince me uh, if I, I forget what the size of the hepatitis A particle is, but... That's the other vaccine that a single dose gives protection. So have you, yeah. have you looked at that? We haven't looked at it, but, but I agree with that. So, so that's an inactivated mm. live vaccine. And my guess is most of those, when, they, when you cross-link with formalide, you disrupt enough of the epitopes so that you know, some of them are in the right confirmation, but many are not. It's enough to make an antibody response, but you don't get good cross-linking. And I think it must be that the hepatitis B, which is a very rigid structure, okay? A. I mean, hepatitis A, yeah, is a very rigid structure, and the inactivation process may leave enough of the, the, the primary determinants to make neutralizing antibodies intact, and that's why it differs. I think in the future what we should be doing is, again, what Mark, Mark Slifka described, is to use like hydrogen peroxide and other things that inactivate nucleic acids, but don't disrupt the surface structure mm -hmm. of the virus particle. And therefore, with that way, I think kill vaccines, at least if they're icosahedral viruses, could well end up being very much like the HPV vaccine. We just kind of inactivate them different. But along those lines, IPV is not that great. Yes, virtually the same as hepatitis A, right? But, well, but again, it, it will depend upon individually when you, when you inactivate it, how many of the, the, the determinants you disrupt. Because we think you need to have, have high density determinants at 50 to 100 angstroms. And if every, when we break B cell tolerance, if you go down to 50%, which, which is also a characteristic of this virus-like display, if you go down to 50% occupancy rather than 100%, you basically start to really kill this activity. And so that you can't have one in five of the determinants being normal, that's enough to make an antibody response, but not to make it virus-like. Yes. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's actually a really good point. And I think that's why when I think about virus-like display vaccines, and you may disagree, but, but I like using real viruses where the, the people have been exposed and it's co-evolved with the immune system. And we know that the real virus infection doesn't induce autoimmune disease. I'm really concerned with some of the nanoparticle platforms that are based upon protein because people are really gonna have to look at this because it really is a very effective way of breaking B cell tolerance. And if by chance some of that surface that's exposed cross reacts with self, you're gonna run into trouble. And the people developing those vaccines are really gonna have to deal with this and evaluate this very closely in phase one trials. Okay, I think we should go, thank you. I think we should go on to uh, the last.